BPC is probably one of the most widely used in the ortho regen space for peptides, and so it has a lot of at least anecdotal reports and data behind it. So let's hop into our peptides. So BPC-157, uh, probably the most, my most widely used peptide. It has a whole host of different effects, okay? It upregulates the growth hormone receptor on tendons. It stimulates angiogenesis, so it helps bring new blood flow into an area that might be devoured of blood flow. It's an anti-inflammatory, it's immunomodulatory, it increases nitric oxide production. A whole, again, this is that pleiotropic effect. It's this whole bunch of other stuff that basically then the body can take what it needs and, and do what it wants with it, okay? I start cytoprotective because um, this is how I personally think of uh, BPC working the most, okay? Cytoprotective basically just means it is going to protect a cell. And all the research, and we'll go through a few of those studies, but all the research that has been done, the one common thing about BPC is that it protects a cell when an injury happens, okay? And so, for example, when if we have a transected nerve, right, in a rat model, where well, they will actually cut the sciatic nerve, we see astronomically greater healing when BPC is administered directly after that injury. In clinical practice, I see that BPC works a lot better when we have some form of a stimulus, okay? Whether that's gua sha, whether that is cupping, whether that's prolo, PRP, or stem cell therapy. It's something that is stressing and damaging a cell further than what it is right now. So that way, the BPC can help this cytoprotection side of the equation. Um, the one really interesting thing about uh, BPC is there are currently no published human trials on BPC. And the, most of the research that, I, that started coming out in the early 90s uh, was from a group of Croatian researchers. Now, the, uh, the story that I've been told that I've never been able to corroborate because I don't even know how I'd corroborate it unless I talked to the authors, um, is that this group of researchers discovered BPC many years before their first animal trial. They started using it in ulcerative colitis so an IBD, started using ulcerative colitis, had phenomenal results, went to publish it, was told, you can't publish this because you have no animal data showing that this is safe. They needed that first step of entrance into doing human research. So then they said, okay, we'll go back and we'll do a whole bunch of animal research. So they went on and did probably about, I think about five years of animal research in tendons, ligaments, nerves, uh, cartilage, uh, GI tract, whole bunch of stuff. And then they went and started a clinical trial on ulcerative colitis, which is still ongoing over in Croatia. So, um, so we currently don't have any uh, actual human completed trials to show what we believe is happening with BPC. However, we do have, BPC is probably one of the most widely used in the ortho regen space for peptides and so it has a lot of at least anecdotal reports and data behind it. But when I'm talking with patients about this I'm always upfront about that because I think it's important for them to have that consent before they make that decision and obviously the question of well is this even safe comes up quite a bit and this is generally what I talk about is that the LD50 which is the dose that 50% of the uh, population that takes this dose would die, so it's, that's commonly used in research to look at toxicity, is greater than 125 grams in a human when you calculate it out, okay? Most of the time, our dosage is like 500 micrograms, upwards of a milligram a day. If we're doing intraarticular, we might do like two milligrams. So this is like an astronomical magnitude higher than what the LD50 would be. So uh, we do have a little bit of peace of mind there. Uh, this here was the first animal study. Uh, and again, you'll always, unless I forgot it on the slide, but almost every slide I'll include 
uh, what type of research it was. So that way you guys don't walk away thinking all this was human research when in reality this was rat research. So here is the first study, 1993 on BPC. The other thing you'll start to learn about peptides is that a lot of this research has been around for a very long time. It just hasn't been in the US or Canada very long. Okay, A lot of it's over uh, overseas, Russia, Croatia, some from Sweden. Um, they just uh, they found a, a stronger interest than we did. Um, and my guess is because we were still kind of going through this really strong pharmaceutical boom at this time, and so peptides kind of fell off. Uh, one of the questions that uh, I get a lot is, is there a difference between taking oral BPC, injectable BPC, um, or topical BPC, or even intranasal? Every single research study I've ever looked at, and again, these are all in rats, and so we could do a human trial and things could be completely different, but every single one shows that there is no difference between all routes of administration, okay? Clinically, there's one uh, caveat to that, and that is uh, when we actually do a guided injection under fluoroscopy or ultrasound, we do see better results when we actually deposit BPC and some of the other peptides directly into a tear or directly into the knee joint to bathe the cartilage, okay? Outside that, um, doing it, so some people will think, oh, if I have lateral epicondylitis or epicondylosis, if I do sub-Q injections over top of it, that BPC is gonna get down into the tendon and it's gonna help heal the tendon. If that were true, we could all start doing prolotherapy that way and we'd all have the same results, right? And we don't see that. What happens is you do it subcutaneously here and the bloodstream will pick it up within a few seconds of that being sub-Q and it won't dive down deep into the tendon. And so doing it sub-Q here, no difference than sub-Q in the belly or the glute. And then all the research studies show no difference between, um, between the different routes. However, clinically I'll tell you this. Um, everybody has their something that they respond to better. Okay, some people do respond better to oral. Some people do respond better to injectable. I, the only way I have been able to kind of figure out how to guess which one might be right is what the patient's gut says. So I trust the patient's intuition. If a patient comes and says, you know what, I think I'm gonna have a better response with oral versus injectable, then I say, all right, we're doing oral or vice versa. If they don't have a preference, I generally just tell them to do oral because you don't have to worry about syringes and needles and it's just a nice, easy oral capsule. BPC is one of very, very few peptides that are orally available, okay? You guys might see, once you go home and you're all excited about peptides and you go online and Google, you might see some different peptides that different companies have made that are uh, in oral capsule form uh, the one that comes to mind that is a new recent one is a thymosin beta-4 frag or a fragment of TB4 that's in an oral capsule. Those peptides are uh, generally not stable in gastric juice, okay? The reason that BPC is stable in gastric juice is because BPC in us is naturally found in gastric juice, okay? So it's already stable there because that's where we produce it and that's where it resides. And originally, before these were all synthetically made with an amino acid sequencer, the, uh, they actually used to isolate it from gastric juice. Okay, that's how they made the first peptide. Um, so in terms of uh, this here, this study here, again, this was a traumatic nerve injury, so they transected the sciatic nerve, and they saw an improvement in axonal regeneration. This here was our control with saline, and then we can see, obviously, increased uh, neurofascicles here. Uh, another study showing that the BPC promotes migration of the actual tendon. So when you sever a tendon, you're obviously going to have to have some outgrowth to help reattach it. And treating in a petri dish with uh, fibroblasts from a rat, you could see uh, increased um, migration of those tendon fibroblasts. Here's another one that I actually find really interesting, which is uh, the BPC seems to increase the expression of the growth hormone receptor on tendons, okay? We know that growth hormone and 
and by consequence IGF-1 are important for healing. And so the, this is one of those mechanisms that I was telling you about where it's like, hey, this is not trying to force a pathway. This is more so like trying to help augment what the body is already trying to do because we know that injured tissues already upregulate their growth hormone receptor and BPC just helps augment that, does it a bit quicker and a little bit stronger. So now the growth hormone that you have floating through you can help to increase the, the healing. Um, and then because of this, when we start stacking peptides, right, BPC and our growth hormone secretagogues, which we'll talk about in a bit, uh, are, uh, can be beneficial. So here's the good stuff and the reason y'all came. Here's how I dose it, okay? So we have our non-procedure dosing and then we have our post-procedure dosing. Generally for non-procedure dosing, I'm doing 500 micrograms oral or 300 micrograms sub-Q. Those are the equivalent doses, okay? Obviously we get better absorption with sub-Q, so the dose needs to be less. So those are where we have the equivalent. We're gonna continue that. We're gonna do it minimum four weeks, and then we continue if we have improvement. If I start a patient on BPC and we're four weeks in and they have no improvement, it means they're not going to respond to it for whatever reason. Um, my current suspicion is that it basically just means they already have enough BPC in their gastric juice that they actually don't need to uh, have some form of supplementation of it. But if they are seeing improvements, we continue until they plateau. Post-procedure dosing, I'm gonna do 500 micrograms oral for four weeks and then 500 micrograms every other day for four weeks. So we're basically doing eight weeks post-procedure. And then we have the equivalent dosages there for uh, sub-Q. Uh, 